I feel that Mark is honest. Like I feel you're honest and your honesty deserves my opening up a little bit more. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about the Juicero thesis because most people, right? And I, I'm defining most as like 90%, not 51%. Most people never understood what happened at Juicero, why I did it and, and what happened. So I'm going to share with you succinctly. Doug Evans is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Doug is an early pioneer in the health and food movement. Many of you have probably heard of him before. We've known each other for a while and after losing his mother to cancer and his father to heart disease and watching his brother suffer through diabetes and three strokes, he invested in and co-founded Organic Avenue. Organic Avenue was one of the first organic cold-pressed juice and raw food retailers in the United States. He was the inventor and founder of Juicero, the first at-home cold-pressed juicing system in a three-year period, Doug led the company from conception to production, launched and sold over 1 million Juicero packs. Doug has been an avid sprouter for over 20 years and wrote the Sprout Book. Got a copy right here. Uh, Doug lives off the water grid and food grid in his land with private hot springs east of the Joshua Tree in California and wonderful Valley Hot Springs where he created a sprout lab and has daily practice of sitting, soaking, an Ashtang primary series. Doug, I'm so glad you're here, welcome. Thank you so much, Mark, it's great to be here. You are such a pioneer and it's an honor to be able to share this dialogue with you. I'm so glad that you feel that way. Right in the beginning of your book, you gave a strong accolades to your brother, um, who, who you also mentioned in your biography, struggling with some health issues and stroke, uh, but also who's been the rock and and helping you with a lot of things besides your parents. How have you been during this whole pandemic and craziness up until now? Has all this past experience helped you to be more resilient and and uh, get through this crazy time? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because I am not Pollyanna, right? I am enthusiastic, I am resourceful, and I strive to be a leader. So during this crazy times, you know, for me, it's business as usual because I'm honoring and respecting the request that the government has made to be polite. Like I understand wearing a mask doesn't yeah. protect me but protects other people. So I'm honoring that. But as a result, I don't like to leave my yurt. I don't like to leave my land. I like to do my work remotely. And in this time of this pandemic, I believe the world has advanced considerably on levels of communication. Like the amount of one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls that I've had, which would have been you know, a plane trip and jet lag and travel and expense and enormous you know levels of fossil fuel you know consumed consumed are now being able to be more efficient i was having a meeting with someone in a conference call with someone in hong kong and i was so excited during the call i literally just right before the pandemic i would have been at lax on a plane to hong kong and instead because of the pandemic, because of everything else, I just said, okay, we got to make this work here. So how can I make sure they know my level of commitment, we can exchange information and the like. And, and I did that in, in Australia, in Hong Kong, and in, in Japan. My book is very popular in Japan with the ja the English speaking Japanese who are plant-based and sprout eating and there's a company in, in Japan that sells sprouts in over 20,000 stores. 
and oh every word in my book resonated with them and the the advantage of selling seeds versus selling sprouts just solve so many food safety and transportation issues and shelf life issues and economic issues that they want to like open to the possibility of selling seeds, selling information. And so now this is another thing I add onto my plate is translating my book into Japanese. Are, are you like considering yourself this uh, sprout farmer, urban farmer? You, you're actually in a rural area. So it's a, uh, uh, but you, you really kind of, uh, not only where you live now is kind of in the deserts, off the grid, self-sustaining. Um, you used to have to drive hours to, to go get food. Tell us about that, that, that experience and how you've kind of created this whole self-sustaining area where you're at. Uh, that's a story in and of itself that's worth, worth hearing. Yeah, I mean... It's actually the opposite of what you just said before it became what you said. Yeah. Because I used to live New York, LA, and San Francisco. So I had ubiquitous, omnipresent access to healthy, organic um, food, vegan food, plant-based, farmer's markets. You know, there was always one day of the week, there was always a farmer's market. There was always access to um, organic food. And then, you know, after... Um, Juicero was composted. And, you know, that's a whole other story. I, I immediately felt like a rebound in a relationship. And I started to scramble and I took on an opportunity. And then the energy wasn't aligned with the, the founder of that organization that I wanted to help. And for the first time in my life, I quit. Like I quit something because I felt like, oh my God, A, I don't need the money. I don't want the money, and I don't think that this person is going to change to accommodate my values. So um, in, in two weeks into it, I gave it two weeks. I got my spidey sense tingled on day one, <laughs> but I gave it two weeks. And then when the person asked me to do something, and I said, I feel uncomfortable with doing that, he goes, you're a dummy. And, and I was like, I, I, I may not be like you but i don't think that that's an accurate information and i will not work under those circumstances thank you very much and then he called me over the weekend and apologized and i said i understand that you're sorry and i fully accept your apology and i think you will have to find someone else thank you very much and have the best day ever and i got off the phone and so when I moved, so then I said, I'm going to give myself, I've worked for 50 years. I've been alive. I've worked for most of them, 37 of them. I've been working since I was 13 years old, independent, never went to college, joined the military at 17. So I've worked and I probably saved my first nickel, right? And I had, you know, one good exit and one good failure right under my belt. And so I said, I don't need to work today. So what I want to do is I want to reflect and I want to unpack every decision that I made that could have been done differently, could have been done better. Like where could I look in the mirror? And so I've done two day silent meditations, Vipassana meditations. And I learned a lot from two days, 10 days of no reading, writing, speaking, or eye contact. But I felt that I could have been more productive now that I had this skill and that I didn't need to go to a retreat center to be in silence. I could go find a plot of land. I could be in nature. And I can connect to the universal force of energy and be grounded and be in water and breathe clean air and see the stars. So that was like my modus operandi. And it turns out that most people want to live in popular cities where the rent is extraordinary and the desert is virtually unchartered, um, hostile, hard to live in. But after you go to Burning Man a few times, you realize that you can, you can live anywhere, right? And you could create community anywhere. So I was very inspired after Burning Man to find land 
and and I'm in my tent. I'm in my yurt, which is a Burning Man yurt. This yurt's That's been to beautiful. Burning Man several times. I've upgraded it by adding denim insulation and outdoor fabric, so it's it's comfortable. It's 100 degrees now um, here Fahrenheit, about 48 degrees Celsius, to give you perspective, oh and it's 9:13 in the morning. But so, but when I moved here. Not only was I in the desert, I was in a food desert. And the nearest Whole Foods was one hour and 15 minutes away without traffic, right? So without traffic, it was an hour and 15 minutes away. And that's when I said, oh, this does not make sense. I'm not going to drive. And it's hard to have a garden in sand. It takes years to convert and to do the regenerative agriculture and, and build up the soil, which now I'm doing in my two and a half years later, I finally have an organic garden on raised straw bale, haze. It's coming along fantastically. But two and a half years ago, I came here, nothing was growing, couldn't do anything. And so I remembered in, my, in the back of my mind when I first started to sprout over 20 years ago, and I go, wow, this is really easy. You add water, you, know, you put them in a jar, and things sprout. And it's like necessity is the greatest form of invention. So during that time, I never needed to sprout because I could go buy sprouts. I was in the hustle. Like I'd go grab a pack of sprouts from the, from the health food store. I'd run on the train. I'd run to a meeting. I'd eat my sprouts and then I'd eat everything else. But when I came here, I didn't have a lot of options. And I wanted to be here so much that I knew I was making sacrifices, but I didn't realize that the sacrifices were going to be around food and, and access and you know, organic food. And I am probably the worst person to go shopping with for organic produce if you're in a rush. Because I take my time and I inspect the produce not for beauty. I'm not looking for the biggest, beautiful things, but I'm looking for freshness. I'm looking for cellular integrity, right? I'm looking for the crispness. And I will um, go through till I find, and it doesn't matter. Like a big thing for me is biodiversity. So I don't want to eat the same rice and beans every day and be a, a vegan. I certainly don't want to have um, Oreos and, and oat milk right? I want to get a variety and diversity of whole food, plant-based, organic vegetables, and fruit. So I'm making sure I want to eat a, like a lot of variety. And so it would take me a long time to pick out the things. So when I got here, I, I ordered some jars, I ordered some seeds, and I started to sprout. And every day I was sprouting, I felt like I was getting a bonus of three hours of not being in the car. And then whatever time it took, being in the store, um, of, of shopping. And so I was gaining extra time because the sprouting was very fast. But I didn't know much about sprouts. I had sprouted mung bean sprouts, alfalfa sprouts, and sunflower sprouts. And it turns out like in the United States, alfalfa sprouts are 80% of the market. Mung bean sprouts are about 14, 15% of the market. And every other sprout is you know, sub 4%. So tiny, yeah. So, but being in, you know, access to the internet and access to information, I was looking for organic sprouting seeds. And I was able to get azuki and arugula and chia and flax and clover and radish and red cabbage and um, lentils, all sorts of different lentils. And I was amazed at how many different seeds I could get for sprouting. And so I wasn't sure. And, and in a way, I'm an autodidactic scientist, yeah. right? Yeah. I like the scientific method and I wanted to be most efficient. So I decided to try and to test each different sprouting method, jars, trays, bags, soil, different alternative sprouting means, whether it was an unbleached paper towel, organic cotton, muslim, um, uh, hemp um, uh, husks, coconut husks. So I did all these things. Within 30 days, 
50% of my caloric intake were sprouts. And turns out I was alive. And I was alive by eating living foods, which is a whole different concept. If you talk about eating living foods to the average American, I don't know, you're a global guy, I'm still more of an American. You talk about eating living foods, people yeah, no think clue. sushi. Yeah, they think they you're think eating sushi. sushi. Yeah. Like I'm sticking my face in, mm. in, in the goldfish jar, you know, swallowing whole goldfish. And, but the living foods resonated so much with me that I was like, oh, I need more, I need more. And it turns out that I can overeat French fries. I can overeat um, kale that's been sauteed with oil and salt. I could certainly overeat almost any veggie burger that's on the market. Can overeat raw sprouts. Living sprouts, I cannot overeat. Like I'll be eating, 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 hungry, eating, and then boom, my brain says, my gut says, done, done. And then you're done. But you and also no, have that full feeling as well, don't you? Oh, a hundred percent. Like that roughage, you know, here's the thing, you know, and this is not a trick question. I know you know the answer, but I will say to people, what, what someone says, oh, you're vegan, you're plant-based, where do you get your protein from? And I go back, I go, where did you get that question from? Exactly. Because since when are you a nutritionist? Like, do you want to inspect my stool to see like, what, <laughs> blood, blood test? And I, and I go, you know, where do you get your fiber from? And turns out Dr. Um, Dr. Will B, who wrote Fiber Fueled, in his book, he identified that 95% of people in America are fiber deficient, but they're not protein deficient. But no one's saying, hey, where do you get your fiber from? Because there's not like a global fiber lobby. So, so what I remembered when we started, when I learned this when I was at Organic Avenue, I reiterated it when I was at Juicero, was the US dietary guidelines recommend seven to 13 servings of fruits and vegetables. And the, the way they got that recommendation is against all odds because the, the, the dairy industry, the meat industry, the fish industry, the shellfish industry, the seafood industry, they're all pushing their agenda, right? And yeah. food is big business in the United States. So somehow these people, they, they won't say don't eat meat. They'll say eat leaner meats. And they won't say, you know, don't eat chicken. And, you know, so when we got to the point when I heard seven to 13 servings and a, and a serving is a fistful, I was like, if you're eating just the minimum, seven servings of fruits and vegetables. How do you have room for anything else? How do you have anything room for anything else? So if you look at the diversity and you're getting the calories and you're getting the servings of fruits and vegetables, you're getting the nutritional balance load. Like it's just in there. Like the a, a herbivores and primates um, are not like going through with um, my fitness pal analyzing what they're eating for the nutritional load, right? They're eating a variety of foods. So I don't look at labels because when I'm eating fresh fruits and vegetables, there are no labels on it. Exactly. Like I don't want to eat things coming out of plastic packaging with labels that are old. I want fresh. I want ripe. I want living organic fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, and seaweeds, right? That's what I wanted. And then I added the big S. And that S is not the dollar sign, that's the sprout sign. So exactly. I started to consume sprouts. And then like I'm built on sprouts right now. My energy, my, my whole metabolism, my physical structure, my bones, my nails, my hair, all built on sprouts. And turns out I sleep well. I poop well and I've got good energy and my mind is like laser focused. I'm even aware like of things that I never even thought I'd be aware of. Like I'm aware of, oh, this thought is lingering in my mind. And if I don't take action on it now, it might be at risk. So the things that may have in the past dropped through the cracks 
are now like front and center and they're in there and I'm using the creativity of the mind to create systems so that I don't drop the ball. I don't forget things. I follow up on things and I have the energy. And so if you ask me what's going on in the pandemic in my world, my world is the best ever. And I gone to uh, maybe against popular advice. I went to Los, I went to Los Angeles. I went to San Diego. I went to Palm Desert and I participated in some of the peaceful protests because I felt it was important, right? Felt it was important to do that. And so I'm aware of the pain and the suffering that many, many millions of people are experiencing around the world, whether it's with Black Lives Matter, whether it's with starvation, whether it's with hunger, whether it's with COVID. Um, the things that concern me on the long level are not the risk, the, the people being tested for COVID that are asymptomatic and that could pass it, because I think it's a very concern for, for, for people to be aware of. But I'm concerned with um, fast food. I'm concerned with, with animal products. I'm concerned with climate. I'm concerned with the longer term aspects of what's happening in the world that, that are being you know, ignored when we think about, and, and I'm not a statistician, I don't know any of these things, I'm sure you do, what percentage of people die from, will die in, in the last 12 months or in the next 12 months from COVID, influenza, heart disease, diabetes, chronic illnesses that are preventable? Like almost all of these things are preventable. They're all and, preventable. Right? And these pandemics are largely tied to, they're not, um, separate from the consumption of animal products and the dietary. They're all like these live markets, these conditions where they're stuffing, you know, animal on top of animal on top of animal living on their own feces and, and, and shipping that it's crazy out there. So in, in order for me to be sane, I have to do something. And the stuff that I'm doing is like all about getting the message out for sprouts right? Like yeah, that's yeah. what my life is about. That's what, that's what, what we're about. doing. It's about sprouts. And every day I'm talking about sprouts. I'm educating people about sprouts. I'm answering questions about sprouts and I'm learning about sprouts. So like I'm learning. You've had a huge journey and, and learning process, but, and I know for a fact that you want to hyper-focus, you want to almost specialize in the area you are to be to go pro, to, to envelop it as, as much as possible. But Organic Avenue, Juicero, and your standards were already high for, for many, many years. Your, your view of, of plant-based and of foods and how to produce. And, and, and I think, don't get me wrong, as an outsider, with Juicero in all the enormous production processes that you had to go to hold the standards and how it's done and, and all that process around that, I think your standards even were raised even more because of how you wanted to present that product and how you wanted to do that, that you, I believe you've always had a very critical eye on, on what's quality, what are, it needs to be, it needs to be live and fresh and, and those things. So I, I don't think that ever disappeared, but now it's, you know, you've, you've even stepped it up even more. And, and but that, that history, that past is almost in many respects shaping you for where you've, whether, you know, whether success or failure or whatever, it has shaped you into the direction and this focus that you have now, and I, 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 I do want to talk about it a little bit, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's let let's talk. I'm I'm happy because I feel your truth, right? I feel that Mark is honest. Like I feel you're honest, and your honesty deserves my opening up a little bit more. So. I'm going to just tell you a little bit about the Juicero thesis because most people, right? And I, I'm defining most as like 90%, not 51%. Most people 
never understood what happened at Juicero, why I did it, and, and what happened. So I'm going to share with you succinctly, and I'm going to talk fast because That's it's, fine. it's going to Please come out. Do. These are, I got no prepared notes here. So it's a story that needs to be told. So, yeah. So when I learned that the U.S. dietary guidelines recommended seven to 13 servings, and I was drinking green juice every day at Organic Avenue, and we had large scale commercial juice presses, and we were buying fresh produce from the farm, making the juice, I was getting multiple servings. And when you juice, you're not getting the fiber, but you're getting concentrations of the micronutrients, phytonutrients, polyphenols, and you're getting juices. Phenomenal, because you're actually getting the liquid of rainwater that's filtered through the organic soil, through the roots, through the stems, through the leaves, and through the flesh of the plants. So I loved cold pressed juice. After I sold my interest in Organic Avenue, I'm sitting in my apartment in Brooklyn and I'm missing the juice. And I knew too much about food safety and food security to just go to any other juice bar and just get um, juice. So I was looking, okay, so I went online to Amazon. I went to Bed Bath & Beyond and the um, Bloomingdale's and Macy's and um, Williams-Sonoma, wherever the juicers were sold. And all the juicers were antiquated and they were all based on a centrifugal. And there was one co um, commercially available juice press. It was $2,500. Right, so it was like literally eight times the cost of an average juicer, and it wasn't safe because it had pinch points where you could crush your fingers, you could stick your hand in the grinder, and you still had to go buy the produce, wash the produce, chop the produce, then clean and do the whole setup. So that wasn't a real viable option, although I bought the machine myself. So I bought the $2,500 personal um, juice press but I didn't use it because it was such a pain. So then um, I reflected on, okay, well, what am I gonna drink? So I'm drinking water. Water is like the healthiest thing. I drink water all the time, but I, I was craving the, the boost that I was getting from the fresh chlorophyll, from the fresh um, micronutrients and phytonutrients. Like, I love that. That was like a fuel to me. So everyone else around is drinking coffee. And I'm watching people have an espresso machine using it once or twice or more a day. And the juicer is sitting on their countertop or under the countertop and they're not using it. And I said, if I can make a juicer that was as easy to use as an espresso machine, people would use it. And the people who could afford it would pay the premium. And this is a first generation. And the first Nespresso machine and the first Keurig machine came out and they were $1,500 yeah. for the first machine. And so I started to think about how could I do it? What does this mean? But I had 10 years. So I had 20,000 hours of professional juicing. I was a juicing pro. We had 10 retail stores. We were doing hundreds of thousands of cold pressed juices per month. So we were doing real volume or, or per quarter to be accurate. You know, um, I come from the production side of food and do a lot with production and that as well. And, and I think you guys were using good nature presses, commercial grade quality presses, and also in store high, high turnout presses and, and uh, juicers to do this. I mean, that's no joke. Oh yeah. We started with one Norwalk, then we yeah. went to five Norwalks. Then we went to one Good Nature X1. Yeah. Then five Good Nature X1s. Then five Good Nature X6s. So we went from 12 quarts an hour with the Norwalk to 15 gallons an hour with the Good Nature X1 to 50 gallons an hour with the Good Nature X6. And then we got the Good Nature Squeeze Box 280, which yeah. was 24 plates. Huge, and yeah. 500 gallons an hour. So I knew a lot about juice and the supply chain. So I then went and understood the process of how you make cold pressed juice 
is you basically take the produce, whole produce, and you dice it, slice it, chop it, shred it, and the whole produce goes into a cheesecloth bag, and then it goes into the press, and you press it, and you separate the water molecules from the cytoplasm or the cellulose, and that's how you get juice. And that bag could be squeezed by hand, it could go into a press, it could go into a ringer, but it was all about how do you separate the juice from the fiber. The invention that I had in the insight was if you could take the produce and put it in the bag and you could put an over bag around it and then you put that into the, the, the machine and you pressed it, you weren't contaminating the machine. So there would be no cleanup required. So that was the big insight. And then the next level was all produce that's sold in the supermarket is old, whether it's two days old, three days old, a week old or two week old, I wanted fresh. So what we had done at Organic Avenue, which we did at Juicero, and the vision was, let's establish relationships directly with the farmers. Let's create a system that when we need the produce, they will harvest, ship it to us fresh. We will then wash it in a systematic way to reduce the microbial load, right? Very loud, um, to reduce it by at least 2 million to one reductions of pathogens from the soil, from the handling. And then, so that was one hurdle, the super washing techniques, triple washing each item. We then kept it cold. So cold kept it fresh. And then we had nine food scientists um, in the company in, in quality and service. And the top PhD who ran our R&D said, Doug, you need to add ascorbic acid or citric acid as an acidulant to reduce the pH because that will reduce the risk of pathogens growing and spreading. And so on my own, thank um, goddess for Google, I researched citric acid and absorbic acid. And turns out citric acid isn't from citrus. It's like from black mold in China and it's labeled really well and it's used in practically everything. And I was like, no way. And then I also, the clue from the FDA was if you use citric acid or absorbic acid, those are preservatives and you can't call it fresh. And I was obsessed with fresh because all juice that came in a bottle was pasteurized using thermal or non-thermal technology and I want it to be fresh. So I said, none of that. So we ended up you know, being creative and we sliced lemons and we put lemons in it. So obviously if you slice a lemon, you're gonna get a lot of lemon juice. But if you put the whole sliced lemon in there, including the fiber, it's still lemon, not lemon juice. It's lemon juice if you would have juiced it and put the juice in. So we were very careful about making the product fresh. But what was inside the pack was 100% fresh organic produce, no water added, no preservatives, no nothing, just fresh produce. But, you know, fresh produce that is water-based, that's grinded, sliced, and shredded can be, you know, have a, a great percentage of liquid. It's just mixed in with the fiber. So we then, I went, I built a prototype. My early prototype was a hot water bottle that was being inflated with an airbrush compressor, pushing a plate, a, a, a cutting board against the plate, and that was the press. And then we took the produce, put it in cheesecloth, put it in a Ziploc bag, cut off the corner, put it in the machine, and voila. So w why it was easy, easy, to raise capital because I would show up and with this, th these bags of produce with the machine, plug it in and I could make this fresh juice that was so delicious, so fresh, so alive that people were like, wow, wow. Cause most people had never tasted fresh. It was so fresh that you could have a green juice that didn't even have apple in it. There was no sweetener. Like we were using the natural sugars that were in the green leafy vegetables um, in order to provide flavor. 
So, Fabulous. so we did that. I built prototypes. I ended up, you know, going to the head of good nature and, and licensing their patents and getting him to help build prototypes and do a lot of things. And then I went to Silicon Valley and then Silicon Valley drank it up. They loved it. And they saw that this was a very big business because um, people need to drink, right? So what are your options for drinking? Water, flavored water with high fructose corn syrup and sweeteners and add-ons, energy drinks, beer, wine, soda, alcohol. Like, so the, the choices for fresh drinks were, were limited. So the idea of fresh juice on demand and the, the, it worked. So we ended up building a team. We raised a lot of capital north of $120 million in capital. We built the machines. We hired 50 engineers. We, um, the, the 12 PhDs, the nine food scientists, we had a real serious team working on this. And people who were tuned in, they loved it. They, they loved it. Absolutely loved it. Right? People who weren't tuned in, it was an enigma. Like, what is this? How does someone, you know, why does a company need a hundred million dollars to do a juicer? And then in the age of social media and online and no fact checking and jealousy and clickbait and hating, Juicero became a meme for excess. And one of the things they criticized was so relevant today was I realized when you put the produce in the bag and you put that bag in a refrigerator and a month goes by, that bag, which was opaque because the, the produce was sensitive to light, time, and temperature. So the, the, the a light would increase oxidation. So we put an opaque bag. Turns out a fresh bag and a one month old bag or a three month old bag all look the same. And if someone would consume one month old or three month old produce, the level of E. coli 0157H7 that's in produce, but when it's fresh, it's very low load. In a month, it's increasing a million times a day. Three months, it's deadly. Yeah. And I had read the Harvard Business School case study in 1997 about Adwala, where people died from drinking raw juice. So I said, oh, wait, we can't do this. I don't want to put people's lives at risk. I want to help people. So we went back and I said, problem, you know, requires solution. So we defined the problem. And I said, okay, well, what if I can prevent how can I prevent someone from consuming a pack that's expired? So one of the ideas and the first thing we did was we put a RFID tag on it, yeah. right? And then if you put the RFID thing in the machine and it was old, it would reject it because there could good. be a battery and a clock. Yeah. But then, you know, having a conscience, right? And guilt, I said, oh, e-waste on the RFID takes the entire pack and makes it non-recyclable and has the e-waste and would cost more to recycle and take apart that pack than it was thing. So we had to keep things simple so we could be in the recyclable chain. So that's when we said, oh, we put a QR code on it. And then the machine could do the QR codes. And, and that I could have done without Wi-Fi right? Because we could have algorithmically created a formula of encrypted QR codes that the machine would read. But then there was another area that we were learning that the packs, as you press them, depending on whether they were all fruit-based or vegetable-based or mixed, required a differing pressing algorithm. And when we ship the machines, we wouldn't know all of those because they would develop over time. The second thing was, if you look at food recalls and foodborne illness in the United States, above meat, chicken, fish, produce had the most recalls. So I said, wow, 
well, if we can connect the machine to Wi-Fi and we can talk to the reader and we could put a QR code on it, that QR code could have the full chain of custody of the produce. Where did the produce come from? What farmer? Where did it go? When was it packed? What ingredients were inside? What nutrition were inside? And then the QR code would read it and display that information in the hands of the individual user. And in the event that there was a food recall from my iPhone, I could literally stop the presses. We could go out to any network, stop any press, any pack from consuming something that may be compromised either for date or for voluntary or involuntary recall. And that would allow me to sleep at night. And it turns out as we researched with the FDA and the Food Safety Modernization Act in the United States actually will hold the CEO accountable for the food safety issues. And there've been many CEOs that have been prosecuted and incarcerated for violations of that and for me, I wasn't worried about that. I was just saying how I want this to help people. So there were layers. So in a first generation, and we started Juicero in 2013. Today, in 2020, everything is connected. But to have a connected device in 2013, seven, eight years ago, way ahead of its time. That's a costly and product, and it's way ahead of its time. Costly product. So... So as a result, we were growing 20% month over month. We were bringing you know, health to the people who wanted it. And we were somehow antagonizing everyone else. It's like people love to like hate vegans, right? It, it's, it's so funny. I mean, this is a vegan thing. I don't, I don't really get it. But someone could be eating McDonald's and no one will say anything to them. Someone is vegan, and all of a sudden, you're under the microscope. Well, where do you get this? Where are you getting your omega-3s? Where are you getting your protein? And it's like vegans are targets for all sorts of, of things. I don't really get it. I, and so we became a target, we became a meme, and then you know, I made another mistake, which I will say I was founder and CEO, the board of directors suggested, hey, Doug, we can bring in the president of Campbell Soup, who is the former chief operating officer of Coca-Cola. And he ran their juice business, the Minute Maid business and the Adwala business. And he sold a billion pounds of carrots. And you can design the trains. He'll make them run on time. And there was you know, big stakes, $100 million of capital. And I said, if you think that's a good idea, then I will be supportive. And that's when like, it was over. It was really over. And that was, um, I don't have regrets because my life is the best ever, but in my unpacking and I unlearned, that was something I would, probably wouldn't have done. Right? With what I know now, I wouldn't have done. I wouldn't have done then. But so at the end of the day, Bad press, investors fickle, they decided to gracefully shut the company down, sell the assets, and everyone goes do something else. And the trauma, do you know the trauma? I have a lot of, you know, um, compassion for the investors who invested and lost money. But do you know where my real compassion goes for? Twofold. One, for the customers who had the machine, who were using it nine times a week, who yeah. had to send it back and lost the service. But the, the worst of all, the thing that like really pains me the most were the employees who worked so hard on this moonshot. And we launched it. And we you know, left the atmosphere and it launched. And then it got shot down. And that's the thing that's the, the hardest for me. Like there are employees who worked at the company who still won't talk to me three years later oh, because of sad. the pain, the pain. Now the, the, the first level people like the C-level suite, 
they understood what, what happened. But deeper in the organization, they, they didn't get it. Like it's, it's hard. And so that's the hard part. And the, probably the fourth thing, which is the most painful, is that since then, there's been no innovation of juice. Yeah, like there's juice been no substitute, no nothing come out that, that's there. And it's, it, it's really sad. So I, 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 maybe, maybe you'll go back to it eventually, maybe not. But I am I'm so glad that you had that wonderful success. In my opinion, it, what it still is a wonderful success. And it was also a great learning experience for you in many, many, many aspects, not only the high standard of quality, uh, and, and it was a bad rap. It was a bullshit uh, outcome. Honestly, going back to any of the machines that you, you mentioned leading up that are just more expensive for <laughs> juicing or coffee, um, what have they all come out with? Koyri came out with a K cup that's reusable that you've put your own coffee grounds in a little cup like that so you can have one cup uh, reusable without K cup servings. Uh, for what? For a $1,500 machine? I, I could just get a yeah. regular coffee machine well, well, for well, that, right? Well, but here's the thing when, when Keurig came up with the K cup, the original one was $1,500. Yeah, now I bought it. Like but now it's like $99. Oh, yeah. So things come down in price. But the fact that you could squeeze the pack by hand would be just saying, do you need the, do you need the, the, the Keurig machine or the Nespresso machine? Or could you tear open the pack and pour hot water over it and get your coffee? Like that beautiful denim shirt that you're wearing, you could wash that in the kitchen sink yeah. with less water, less soap, and faster than using a washing machine and far less energy. Yeah. Right, you can do that. So, There's so many things you could like so, that. So, the, the idea is we live in an irrational world. So, that's where, like, I don't even bother talking about it. I don't need to be expository. Yeah. I know the truth. I yeah. know that I did my best with the information that I had at that moment. And now I have new information. And what, the, the thing that was true, and this was true, it was. If you went to a juice bar and you bought a juice, $6 to $10. You bought a Juicera pack, it was $6, right? And so you didn't get any economic advantage. You got a fresher product, but you didn't get the economic advantage that if you go to Starbucks, you could pay $5 for a latte. And if you use an espresso, it's 50 cents. So you had that advantage. With Sprouts, you have that advantage. Because if you buy Sprouts in the store, you're paying $5 a serving, but if you grow them on your own, it's 20 cents. So that's where sprouts were the, the resolution and the solution for me to get my message out at the broadest scale that sprouts are vegetables. So I think there's global consensus around the world that vegetables are good for you, sprouts are vegetables. The insight that I had when I wrote the book was that seeds have been around from the beginning of time. In order for a seed, to grow, it germinates. And that germination is a sprout term. Nature doesn't think like, oh, my seed is a sprout now. Nature wants to grow, right? It is how nature goes. So from the beginning of time, seeds were planted either wildly or cultivated, and they took weeks or months or years to grow into fruits and vegetables and trees, weeks, months, or years. The insight that I had was, hey, there's this little window between day zero and day seven where you have sprouts and you can eat these sprouts and they're pennies of servings. And not only are you consuming something that is nutritious, it is more nutritious on a per calorie and per gram basis than the mature vegetables. And there's these other incredible healing properties, the anti-cancer, anti-chemo protective um, properties of like the cruciferous vegetables. So everyone knows like in the science community that cruciferous vegetables have glucoraphanin, which forms sulforaphane, which is phenomenal as anti-cancer as well as um, helps offset some of the treatment of chemotherapy in the chemoprotective properties. So everyone knows that. Um, Paul, Dr. Paul Lay and, and um, Jed Fahey at Johns Hopkins University were challenged with which of the cruciferous vegetables and which broccolis have the most glucoraphanin, the precursor to sulforaphane. 
and they found out broccoli sprouts can have 50 to 100 times of the mature broccoli, and that put broccoli sprouts on the map 25 years ago, but they're still barely on the map. My mission is to get sprouts out there, whether you're like, you know, different categories. If you want protein, you know, rather than have what's in vogue, pea protein, whey protein, hemp protein, powders and shakes, you could take seeds. Like just imagine taking peas, right? Sprouted peas, green peas, take the peas. When you soak them, you double the antioxidant level, you triple the vitamin C level, and you're getting in a cup seven or eight grams of protein. So you're getting like this serving and you're getting all the fiber. So like sprouts are a complete food. They're fiber rich, they're nutrient rich, they're pennies a serving that what's happening now is since the sprout book came out, this is my early advanced copy that I keep in my desk. Um, since the book came out, people are tuning in, turning on to healthy, vibrant, sprouting globally. And I see we are at the beginning of a sprouting revolution. And what I'm encouraging people is to ask the questions because since I wrote the book, I've learned more information since the book was done than before I wrote the book. And that's why I called it the Sprout Book, not the Sprout Bible, because it's not a Bible. It's the beginning of a conversation to get people out there to, to sprout. And I'm so glad that you did. And my, my question was leading, and you, you may have misunderstood it just a tad bit. I, I'm so thankful for the big history of, of where you came. I wanted to know the production and the deep insight of, of the knowledge and, and what's gone into this. It's de you're not some crazy vegan or somebody out there who's just, you know, let, let's do this as a side hobby. This is a real deal. And so I see this also as the sprout book and not the Bible that uh, from what I know of Doug and, and, and I've known you a little bit, not that intensive. I know that there's got to be more to come that eventually not only are you starting the conversation, you're continuing to learn, but there's more to come. And so that's, that's where I was kind of leading you because I want to know right. what's, what can we expect next in the sprout arena from, from the Doug compound? And m maybe can I caveat it with, um, because I'm a sustainable futurist, I'm thinking sustainably in the future. So I've been sprouting, I've been eating sprouts for a long time myself. I, I've told you this before, I, I really like these, these radish uh, type of uh, chia and these kind of really, in German they call it gewürzig, so it's a really seasonal, spicy type of, uh, of a mixture, you know, a mixture of a few, because I, I like that, I just, I love it. Regardless of that, are you thinking about your own uh, seed bank, your own seed uh, resources, or how people who are, are thinking more self-sustaining can not only yeah. do sprouting daily, but then also create their own seed banks, some new methods besides just the jars on, on a maybe, you know, more future large scale daily every day. That's just yeah. a, a natural habit, things like that. I mean, I, I'm thinking of all of those things. And what I'm doing is I'm working with and supporting many different organizations, institutions about getting the sprout message out there. And I'm doing it one day at a time. So as a inventor, right, I've got huge ideas. As an entrepreneur, I've got huge ideas. As a humanitarian, I've got huge ideas. So today, you know, my message is get people to sprout with the equipment that's available, the seeds that are available to get the highest yield and to think about sprouts as something that you can add to everything. Like just start eating sprouts and watch the world change. So that's like my message and my mantra now, but I'm obsessed with thinking like, how do we make it easier? How do we make it fresher? How do we make it safer? All those things like are in the mind. But right now I wanna talk about what people can do today. And today order organic seeds, 
order mason jars, get some cheesecloth, you know, watch the infinite videos on YouTube, follow my Instagram, buy the Sprout book, talk to your friends, get sprouting. That's what it's about. Start sprouting, stay sprouting, stay healthy. I love it. That, that's a super message. So I always ask some very hard questions um, in, in the podcast, and I'm going. You're you're not going to get free of of those questions. I'm going to ask you as well. I believe that you do have the answers, or or you do have them for you. I want them to you to answer them for you. The, the first one is the burning question. WTF, and it's not the swear word that you think, although that's probably what we're saying with the things that are going on in our world. It's what's the future? And I want to know what's the future for Doug? I think the future for Doug is to grow like a sprout into the healthiest, most valuable human that I could be in this physical form while there is breath in me. That is the future. Thank you. The next one is, do you feel like you're a global citizen? And what if in the future there were no walls, borders, nations, or limitations dividing us? Do you consider yourself that? Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I consider myself not just a global citizen, but like an earth citizen. and um, the, the word citizen um, usually doesn't apply to animals, but I feel like I'm part of the animal community. And I think the animal suffering causes suffering for all. And how we treat our animals is how we'll treat our neighbors. And the idea that, that, that someone on the other side of the border or a different wall is different than us and we should discriminate. It's very hard to think about um, any reason to treat someone of different skin color or different language or different um, species even when you know, we're all here as a gift. So I, 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 I think in, in your vernacular, I will say, yes, I, I raise my hand to join the global citizenship. And then I also want to add the compassion for the environment, for plants, for animals, and do even more because it's one big ecosystem that's required. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? I think it's a matter of every decision goes to the filter and saying, is this decision going to create love? or is it serving the love in the higher order, or is it serving the ego? And so if, if everyone just thinks about those parts um, and we're kinder to people and more compassionate, I think everything will be better. And I, I, I just love you, Doug, and I appreciate uh, all you do. Keep up the fight and keep going and uh, be happy. You got it. Mark, thank you so much. Namaste. Namaste. Um, we'll talk to you soon, Take my friend. Take care. Thanks, Doug. Thank Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye.